Good day, everyone, and welcome to the next installment here on Story State. I am super excited about this session. We have one of the most uh, world-renowned uh, experts, not only experts on Mississippi fiddle tune music, but also one of the most world-renowned players of this archaic yet important uh, art form that, uh, that has originated in the Great Magnolia State. And uh, Harry Bullock is joining us today. Harry is uh, joining us from his home in um, balmy upstate New York on this balmy February afternoon or morning, I guess I should say. But Harry is a native Mississippian um, who has taken the Mississippi fiddle tradition and really um, introduced it to the world in a way that a few other, few other players and storytellers have, have ever been able to capture. We're going to get into the storytelling element of this music because like so many art forms that have come out of Mississippi, um, the fiddle tune music tradition of Mississippi, which is very distinctive, very stylized, um, and very reflective of the times and people and culture of a place and time is, is, is rich in story. So I think there's a lot that we can learn about the storytelling tradition and the music tradition of this, of this music, which, you know, Harry, quite frankly, it's flown under the radar screen. When you think about Mississippi blues and you think about Mississippi's influence on rock and roll and certainly country music um, writ large, um, those have all been very well documented and very well understood by the, the, the greater public. Perhaps what's less known, um, except for a, you know, a, a, a finite community of real you know, strong enthusiasts like yourselves and others in traditional string band music is this tradition of Mississippi fiddle tunes. Why, why has it flown under the radar in your opinion? Primarily because it's instrumental music. And we don't have a culture of listening to that unless you're a jazz or a classical fan. And those are small percentages of the American populace listening public. Um, we could, and for the purpose of this conversation, blame it on Jimmy Rogers, <laughs> who recorded a uh, Mississippian, uh, recorded, uh, first recorded in about 1927 in Bristol, Tennessee, at the same session that the Carter family was quote unquote discovered. Right. That, while it took a few years, quite a few years to play out, uh, really, to just before and certainly after World War II, that's where country music made a big turn, mm -hmm. at least in the media world. And the turn was from what, what had been ballad singing and um, fiddle playing for home audiences because that was the entertainment that was available in your locality with no radio, no records. You could only listen to who was there. These were art forms that, that carried well tended to be women singing ballads and guys uh, playing fiddle and often drinking. Um, <laughs> which is why the women didn't partake in the uh, rowdy square dances and the fiddling. It was a bit dangerous for them. Right. So the songwriting and singing with Jimmy Rogers and the Carter family began to take over what became Nashville. And, and the whole pop country thing and, and the music that most people know about. And fiddlings took a backseat. Uh, it survived a bit in bluegrass in Western swing, which were briefly popular. But and it's in the background behind the singers doing, oh, that fiddle stuff, not fiddle tunes, but, you know, paraphrasing the melody or doing breaks. And most people hear it as, oh, that fiddle stuff. And therefore, all fiddle music is kind of the same thing. Right. But when you take it back before our villain of the day, Jimmy Rogers, 
<laughs> and you know, each tune was different. People had, were used to hearing it, and they, they had favorites because it was the music of their life. Sure. And as, as you know, there's like medical research. People in the hospital heal better when they hear those pop tunes from when they were young and mating and dating. It just invigorates you. So this was the music that would have been available and out there, the dances you would have gone to where you met your life partner. Right, right. So, so uh, basically, the taste change radically yep. after World War II and bluegrass started, kept going. The folk revival started in New York, basically, mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the late 50s and has spun out to now where there's a festival scene, fiddle contests spread out through the country. And this particular old timey stuff that mus that Mississippi fiddle tunes are a subset of, there's thousands of people, the big annual festival pre-pandemic um, in West Virginia would draw somewhere approaching 5,000 people over the cliff top. Most yeah, of them. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because leads to my next question, which is um, the, the Mississippi fiddle tune vernacular is a little bit different than the Southern mountain vernacular as far as stylization, syncopation. Um, how would you describe, first of all, is my thesis correct? Um, and if so, how would you describe the differences because to my ear and i spent a lot of time in virginia and southwestern virginia and west virginia and eastern kentucky and western north carolina and you know also play clawhammer banjo myself um that has a different drive and a different um to me at least a different drive and sensibility curious as to your point of view of what really sets mississippi fiddle tune music apart there are some similarities but and we'll talk about it from that point of view, but simultaneously, each fiddler or each small group of fiddlers in each community, each band sound pretty radically different. Mm -hmm. um, you hear Carter Brothers and Son who made 78s, they were thought to be from Arkansas, they sound like they're from North Carolina, they got that relentless drive that you're talking about as a clawhammer banjo player, um, where the there's a relentless forward motion, it's the beat is is steady, it's great for dancing. Uh, it's predictable where you're going rhythmically, you set up one groove and you just cruise along. And a lot of southern fiddling does that there's each state has its own take on what the groove is. And people who are really into fiddle music can hear and go, Oh, that's Kentucky. Oh, that's North Carolina. Um, there's Mississippi, there's North Georgia, you can hear it coming a mile away if you live and breathe this stuff. Right. Most folks, it's that fiddle noise again. Right. But Mississippi is a little more, a little, it can be very propulsive. And some of the bands are straight up, as I mentioned, Carter Brothers. But um, Mississippi bands tend to like pick a note and hang out, out on it for a little while. It kind of starts and stops and the energy is changing over the course of the tune which is rough on banjo players. And we don't have a documented strong tradition of banjo players in Mississippi, perhaps for that reason, perhaps just because the vagaries of who collected what, where, and when, and the biases those people had. So you've got kind of start and stop sense built in timing, and I'll play you an example in a minute. Um, there's a real fondness for asymmetrical tunes, tunes that don't match the standard square dance format of eight measures, repeat, eight measures, repeat, right. eight part, eight part. Um, there's a strong African-American influence. I suspect stronger in Mississippi than elsewhere. It's elsewhere as well, but it's pretty pronounced in Mississippi for obvious reasons, um, to the glory of the music, I would say. Sure. Um, there's a little bit of Spanish influence. There were Mexican farm workers. There was, yeah. you hear that particularly Norman Smith, you hear some polka-ish, uh, Southwestern polka kind of tunes. Interesting. Uh, but primarily, more than anything else, the distinctive thing about Mississippi fiddle tunes, and I will point out that in the documented collection of tunes, and I've really, I've transcribed every one of them, about a thousand pages of this stuff. Oh my God. My two books. Wow to make it more accessible for everybody, uh, right. both for people that read notation and then just to say, here it is for the people that don't. Right. The tunes are distinctive. You don't find the bulk of them, you don't find anywhere else. 
unless they were like the Leake County Revelers doing pop tunes from the 1890s where the sheet music was everywhere. But the tunes that are fiddle tunes with relatively few exceptions of the like the top five tunes, Fisher's Horn and Pipe, Billy in the Low Ground, Soldier's Joy, that kind of stuff. Um, they tend to be quirky and they tend to be local. And they and in the 78 era, there's only one tune that was recorded, two tunes that were recorded more than once in the state. So everybody had their own repertoire. Wow. And you know, we have this 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 thing about folk music where the fiddler learned it from his father, who learned it from his father, who learned it from his father. And my response to that is, why aren't we playing Irish music? <laughs> How far back do you go? It doesn't work. And old timey music as we know it came into being somewhere after somewhere after the Civil War, because the document little tiny bit of documentation, and we don't have enough to really be firm about this, that we have of, of notated tunes from around the time of the war, they're Scottish, they're English. Right. They're not, they're not distinctively Southern. So somewhere with African American influence, with banjo, with uh, availability of guitars around the turn of the century, last millennium, 1900, Sears catalog stuff, you start having people playing music at home and they, and they did the best they could with the little bits and bobs of those Scots, Irish, English tunes that they could remember, and then he put them back together in very distinctive local ways. A North Carolina pl player might refer to it as kind of a fr Frankenstein assemblage. I think <laughs> it's creative genius. genius. Right. Um, so you take tune, you take this body of parts, which is the dialect of Southern fiddle music, and then these creative local folks uh, made up their own tunes. And I, in the book, I document quite a few of the people we know who wrote the tunes, which kind of takes that folk music thing and turns it on its head, except they're very strongly, quote unquote, writing these things in this dialect. It's original, but it's also part, uh, part of that great Southern fiddling tradition. So yeah, yeah, that's the best answer I got. Let me try playing you something. To Please. Demonstrate a little bit of it. Please do. I'm gonna start off with one of the war horse tunes everybody knows, Arkansas Traveler. Hmm. So it was a great comedy skit that was all the rage in the teens and 20s. Sure. And then I'm going to play Enos Kanoi's radio theme song in McGee, Mississippi in the 40s nice. version of Arkansas Traveler. When I when the recording surfaced about five, six years ago, it was a home acetate that the then 16 year old guitar player, uh, Mr. Uh, Farrell Amerson had this sole copy of this thing, um, it turned up and I was like really excited that un, Unheard Mississippi Recording came up. And then I, there were like three songs on it that were hideous. Mostly all you heard was pedal steel, not doing much of anything and, and Mr. Canoy banging on a mandolin in no appreciable manner. And then I saw it was so I traveled and I was really disappointed. I was looking for gold, quirky Mississippi stuff that I hadn't heard anywhere else. And then I started listening to the Arkansas Traveler and I'm like, oh really? Huh. So I will play you that version for you. Awesome. Uh, but we'll start with if my best attempt at the standard Arkansas Traveler, which I don't play much because the gold is Kanoi. <laughs> You hear the fairly straightforward, predictable rhythm. You hear some chordal movement. You hear a melody that um, you can sing a bit of. Absolutely. But mostly it's that forward momentum that I'm played it for. Now let's play a little bit of uh, Enos Kanoi's version or his take on it. <laughs> Thank you. 
Mr. Bullock. That is awesome. And you're right about that hanging on a note and, yeah. and, 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 and hitting that affected note. That is, uh, uh, you know, uh, my, 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 my initial reaction went to like West Virginia crooked, but I know that's completely different, but it's. Well, we're, we're, I take my mild exception to the term crooked. That's a term we use for politicians. <laughs> Asymmetric is what I prefer. But Asymmetric. I love it. Everybody else says crooked. I love um, it. Harry, but, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no I was fine. just going to tell you, I'm, I got to admit, um, I'm late to the game, really, when it comes to, to Mississippi fiddle tunes. My, my, um, my focus and my attention over the years has really been on the, on the Southern Appalachian, um, uh, you know, uh, vernacular, if you will. Um, it took really where Brother, Brother Were Out Thou, the film, and, and um, John Hartford's uh, Indian War Hoop to like, what the heck is that? Is that awesome? That really, you know, opened my eyes to the delights of Point Ming and others. How did you find yourself? I mean, obviously you're a native Mississippian, but how did you find yourself getting into this music? Well, you know, I'm proud of my Mississippi connection, but the native part, I, I really only lived in Mississippi for my first year. So my memories are a little fuzzy from that. But I have family and I visited constantly. Grandparents, we took care of it. And I'm very fond of the time I spent in Carroll County as a kid. And I have some beautiful agricultural memories of feeding the cows and swimming in the cow ponds and such. Um, but I went to school, you know, uh, university at the University of Alabama, because we lived there in the state. And as I would ride my bicycle to class every morning, I would drive by this little two-story wood frame, kind of New England pillbox, wood, wood siding thing, white. And it was a sign with uh, about six inches high running the length of this building. And some of the operative words that were lettered onto it were Southern Regional Center for Folk Life Studies. Mm -hmm. I think my memory is there were five or six other words in there. Mm -hmm. And I rode by it and looked at it every day. What the heck is that? I like folk music, which of course, as a as a college kid in the seventies, meant like Dylan and Crosby, Stills and Nash, and like no way was that folk music. But what did I know? You know, we all start out exploring knowledge, shall we say? So one day I got off my bike, went over, knocked on the door, and this <laughs> you see this gray beard, this little gray haired lady grandma type, <clears throat> which feels funny now at being a similar age, uh, came to the door and I just said, who are you? What do you do here? And she said, come in. And she changed my life. Um, I learned my first fiddle tune. I was telling her about some bit of reading I'd done in the library about the dancing and stuff. She says, uh, you do dance, don't you? Fixed me with an evil eye and said, get up. Hauled me out in the hallway and taught me how to swing properly. Here I was learning to dance with granny. It was kind of embarrassing. And then she thought about it and she says, I've got seven students. If I dance to and call, we can have square dances. Next week we were square dancing. Um, I moved after college, I moved to New York. I'm lonely, I'm in a strange place. She told me I had to go dance at the Country Dance and Song Society. And I said, okay, and I went once and then I got to hug strange women every Friday night and they were strange and it was great. And so I did that. And, uh, Pretty soon I realized I really rather the band, the music was drawing me more than anything else. And, and I got the itch to play. And around this was, I just moved to New York and I, and I was still in touch with Beatrice McLean of Tuscaloosa of the McLean Family Bluegrass Band. Uh, but she was the grandmother. And she got somehow, she had pulled some strings and got me into the John C. Campbell Folk School in Berea, Kentucky for Christmas for a week. Take the bus down from New York again I'm in the middle of nowhere where i know no one and what's going on and i am in the middle of it i'm dancing all day i'm staying up all night having beer and listening to people and singing folk songs that i don't know and learning them and watching people play banjo and fiddle and i go oh god i want it. i want to do that yeah. and i got the bug bad and i bought a fiddle from the fiddler there went back to new york took the fiddle out oh no hid it under the bed for several years because it was awful and um and then I heard R. Crumb and his band come, the famous, infamous underground cartoonist and his great little novelty band featuring tenor banjo and crooning and saws and fiddles playing Italian waltzes. Wow. 
Wow. So then I learned the Italian walls, started playing fiddle and hanging out with the crew in New York and learned to play Southern tunes in New York and learned, picked up a lot of Mississippi tunes from those great 78 reissues that County did in the 70s. That was all we knew at that point in time. And I didn't really distinguish that they were Mississippi. They were just part of what everybody learned. There was a batch that were pretty standard. Right. And then um, about 2000, one of my fr friends, a uh, West Virginia traditional singer, I'd given him some tapes and he said, hey, Harry, this, this tune, this Narmer and Smith gallop to Georgia, that sounds like you. Mm. Actually, I think he said it smelled like me, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I said, okay, I listened to it. I went, oh, this is goofy. This is really fun. I love this and learned it. And then I got curious. And then I started doing this 78 search and tracking down every known Mississippi 78 and recording I could find. Wow. And then I started learning all the Narmer and Smith stuff. And I, in 2004, I put out a CD, uh, basically Narmer and Smith homage and other people that were from Carroll County or really near there. Um, and in the course of doing that record, I started talking to my relatives in Carroll County and, get, and I found a newspaper reporter, Susie James, who'd done homework and met all the families and got introduced to the Narmers, the Smiths and the Dukes. And, um, talked to uh, people way on the backside of the county where I'd never been, and they knew my grandfather. Oh, wow. Being a local, I had an in. Wow. And so I actually wound up doing research for that record, something that would never have occurred to me. I'm a graphic designer by background, not a folklorist. I mean, Vicki McLean changed my life. She's a folklorist. I hung out there, but I was a painter. Wow. Um, so long-winded answer, I, I slowly crawled into doing research the doing that carroll county record led me into it and um well the storytelling part is i knew that there was a um, a field trip by the library of congress in 1939 led by a guy named herbert halpert i there was a record that the uh, state department archives and history put out a few years back quite a few years back and it had a lot of great fiddle tunes on there. And I thought, okay, that's the whole thing. That's great. And, and then I had some time. I had a pocket of time and I realized I want to go to the Library of Congress. I've been hearing about it my entire obsession with folk music over decades. This is a mythical place. This is, you know, like Camelot or something. I got to go. But you can't just walk in. I mean, you have to have a mission because it, there's nothing out for you to paw through and you got to ask and they bring it out. Um, and then, and it, it, I saw, I, I realized I wanted a photograph. I wanted a memento of my trip to the Library of Congress. I want a photo of one of those Mississippi fiddlers. I'll hang it on the wall. I'll remember the trip. It'll be great. That was my total ambition. Wow. I go to, I go to Washington for a couple of days. I spend three days photographing 600 pages of his field notes. I'm being catered to by magnificently knowledgeable librarians. There's like six librarians there and I'm gung ho and they're all kind of hovering around. And at the time I'm there, there's like four patrons. They're all gung ho serious people. A couple of people doing gene family genealogy, but it's like videographers and people doing projects and then me. And I don't know why I'm there. I'm just having a good time. But all of a sudden I know a whole lot about the Halpert expedition. I've got way too much to wade through. And I go, okay, where's the recordings and, and where's the, the photographs? They had the mm. contact sheets. They didn't have the photographs. Oh, wow. And the recordings were really expensive. So I nosed around in collectors and got a lot of it and eventually spent some big money getting the rest from the Library of Congress and produced a, a set of all of the fiddle and banjo recordings, which is on document records out of England. It's three CD set of the 147 fiddle and banjo tunes from that trip. Obsession leads you on. So I want that photo. <laughs> so I go to Jackson where I have relatives to stay with. I needed to see anyway. And I go to the ar archives and history in the Capitol looking for that photograph. And yeah, no big deal. Um, they, you know, I found the, I said, give me that one. Oh, hell, give me all of them. You know, wasn't that expensive to get uh, scans and I could print them out elsewhere. But the contact sheets were in a box from the Halpert expedition. There were like seven boxes from the Halpert expedition and they'd mashed it together 
with the 1936 field trip. Wow. In 1936, the W, well, actually 1935, the funding came through for the arts products, uh, pro projects of the WPA, Roosevelt's work program, in the last major depression. And, he, and the only way you could put musicians to work in Mississippi was teaching at that point. They were like eight people doing something in Jackson. Everybody else had to teach. There were like 100, 130 people. They got on the payroll. Things are going great. And then the polio epidemic breaks out and they shut down all teaching in the state. Mm -hmm. And the music project's got a big political problem with people wanting to shut down arts projects. Why would you pay people to do art? You got to eat like everybody else. But so they had to put them work. So they thought, we'll go research folk music. Great. Get 130 classical musicians and send them out to find folk music. Well, the punchline is they came back with about 2,600 hand notated songs and fiddle tunes. Mm. 147 fiddle tunes by my count. It's a little fussy because the line between a song and fiddle tunes is a little indistinct. And they didn't know what they're doing. So they brought back everything, which is great because it's kind of like a snapshot of vernacular music in the state in 1936. It's what people liked. Things off 78s parlor music, gospel, a blues about going to Piggly Wiggly, um, a little bit of everything. And, and I mined that for the stuff that us fiddlers would care about. And that was my first book. I went to get a photo <laughs> and this book told me I had to write it. I That's came awesome. up with so much homework. What, what, a, what, a, what, a, what a great metaphor for a great storyteller. Um, that's, that's terrific, Harry. Um, I want to return just a second to, to Hoyt Ming, because I know you've tracked down a number of fiddlers, have interacted with a number of, uh, of fiddlers and their families uh, over the years. Um, but in my mind, and again, I, I know there's a lot of legendary greats, but there is something about, I remember taking a road trip, just a random road trip. My son was attending Mississippi State University. My daughter went to graduate school there as well. So I spent a lot of time over in Starkville and I decided I'm gonna go see some of the countryside. And I drove over, um, you know, down the trace a little bit and up and meandered through the country, ended up in Ackerman. And just by serendipity, um, the state does a great job with, you know, historical storytelling. They had a, they had a uh, historical marker there on the square in, in Ackerman about Hoyt Ming and his pep steppers. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I, um, I had no idea. I knew he's from Mississippi because of the movie, but, and again, I'm a recent convert to the Mississippi vernacular, but I had no idea he was from, he was from that area. Um, so just to satisfy my own, my own um, morbid curiosity, I would love to see, uh, hear how you interpret um, his music. And if you could talk just a little bit about uh, Hoyt Ming and his influence um, and then play some of his music, if you don't mind. Hoyt Ming is one of the great touchstones for Mississippi fiddle music. Um, his Indian war whoop is one of the strangest fiddle records, Southern fiddle records that there is. Um, it, and he's strangely unique among Southern fiddlers. It, I, I suspect it's a very, I mean, just audio, listening to it, you hear a very strong African-American influence the tune itself is two melodic bits that as it, as he plays through each pass of the tune, it's a different length. Mm. Adds a few beats, hangs out, does that little hiccupy thing, mm -hmm. goes yeah, every now and then, which was his fiddle contest trick. He would um, be on stage doing this one chord tune and then turn around so the audience couldn't see him and his bow would move and you'd hear that sound and you had to guess whether he was singing it or playing it. Uh, he was singing it, I mean, you know, what else? But that was, he, it was his contest winning tune, which he learned from uh, two sources, but one of them was Pearl B Burdeen. Mm -hmm. Now in my research, that name comes up in the, in the 1916 era Kosciuszko fiddle contest, which was a big deal in the state. Literally hundreds of fiddlers showed up. Now, if you if you only know 78s and those those Halpert recordings, it's like 30 people, and you go, oh, there was nobody playing old timey in Mississippi, because that's all there is. But if you check the newspaper accounts, there were a lot of what I assume were lesser fiddle players, or you know, it's kind of a pyramid. You get to hear the top, but you don't, <laughs> if you're lucky, you don't hear the bottom. Um, 
And I don't know that's true. They could have all been great. I mean, but there were the point is there were hundreds and it was a widespread activity in the teens where it was the pop music of the day that was what people knew. Mm -hmm. Well, heard it all I know about Pearl Burdine, other than I found his granddaughter and got some photos for the book, which was a coup because no one had seen it. Um, is that his contest winning tune was Indian War Whoop and Hoyt Ming learned it from him. Oh, wow. And Pearl was his cousin. So Hoyt learned tunes in his immediate area from family and friends, and they don't sound like anybody else. He, re if he either reshaped them into his own idiom, his own sense of rhythm, or his neighbors, and he had a real interesting little pocket of music, and we have no way of knowing. He's gone. Harry, you, you, Harry, you mentioned the African American influence in that song, which is pronounced. Um, I have a buddy who's a fiddler up in Appalachia, and he also is big time Mississippi fiddle and big fan of yours. Um, but he also was alluding to um, perhaps maybe Choctaw influence. That's a reach. I have actually heard some recordings of. Choctaw fiddle music, which the tribe is not happy to have out there, though there is one video on YouTube. Um, the recordings I've heard, you hear bits of like Sally Good and then it wanders off into a chord and, and mm -hmm. the guitar player doesn't seem to be doing, he's sort of off in his own world. It's really mm -hmm. hard to know if this was a tradition or if they're just jerking the folklorist around and mm -hmm. having fun with it with the outsider, because we really don't want you to share this because we've been treated poorly by white people our entire history. Um, I don't know what Choctaw music is, number one. You'd think there'd be some influence, but I don't hear it. I can't mm -hmm. find it. Mm -hmm. um, I can't document a single tune or a part of one. Mm -hmm. um, I think Perhaps the, the ones that stayed into the era to share fiddle music assimilated, like Greenwood Lafour, mm -hmm. who sold that as tribe. I really don't know. It's yeah. a cipher. It's one of those things we wonder about. African American, yeah. you can hear, you can find an occasional Swedish or German influence, uh, Southwestern, um, English, Scots, Irish, that you can find. Choctaw. We all kind of want to know that it's there, but I can't, yeah. I can't point my finger. No, appreciate that. It's kind of sad. Yeah. Like a lot of those historical turns. Um, anyway, uh, Hoyt Ming. In 1975, my co-author, Tony Russell, visited Hoyt Ming. Carl Fleshheimer took the photographs. Uh, Hoyt was gone by the time I was digging, and I really didn't, could not, get access to the family. Um, Hoyt and his son, Hoyt Jr., who was a player, were both gone. I, I couldn't get any leads. I My detective work failed. I reached out through the old timey network and basically when Hoyt Jr. died, the connections died. They may be out there somewhere. They may be hearing this. I apologize. I couldn't contact them. But Tony wrote up a chapter on them because he met them and documented the trip. And, and he's an Englishman from London, came in the 70s. It, it's really, until this book, my two books, the only documentation on Mississippi fiddle tradition is by this English guy, mm -hmm. who's a lovely person. I, I've never physically met him, but I've talked to him many times and corresponded with him for decades. An absolute gentleman and an incredible knowledgeable scholar. I could not have conceived of doing this second book without him. I, I just told him that up front. It's like, what's this going to take? How are we going to do this? You know, it took a little while, but I talked him into it mm. and it made the book so much better. But anyway, the point of this long digression is just that Tony's the expert there, not me. Got it. However, Hoyt Ming is on the cover of the book for two reasons. One, it's a collection of the book is, is 560 pages of transcriptions and stories and photographs about a multitude of Mississippi musicians. So therefore I had to get some kind of iconic photo that had a lot, more than one Mississippi musician in it. Um, and so there was a band, Roselle and his brother, uh, Troy um, and Hoyt, and then the square dance caller Coggins standing in the background. 
So it's multiple mu Mississippi musicians. It's a reach, but it's what we could do with the material, vintage materials we had. And then the real reason is that um, Hoyt Ming's recordings are just intensely Mississippi. And there's nobody else like him. He had this, I mean, the fiddle style is interesting and loopy and like hang out and wait and then hiccup for a while. And it's rhythmic, but it's a different kind of rhythm. And it's, it's the sort of thing that could drive a claw hammer banjo player nuts. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's brilliant stuff. Uh, on the recordings, uh, the, the recording company decided they really liked the sound of Roselle's feet tapping. And they, they, micro, they got made sure that it was audible on the record. It's quite loud. It's like there's a drum track. And her rhythm's good. Um, you can sort of hear a guitar. You can maybe there's a mandolin in there, and you hear the fiddle and the singing, and you hear the feet. And there's nothing else like it on the record in southern music. So very distinctive. So we, you know, he's an icon. So that's why he's on the cover. Um, and you know, there's the cover thing and Oh Brother, which is still out there in public awareness. Um, and more than anything else. He's a very creative musician, either he or his associates. It's a little hard to know exactly how that happened. And I think that the defining characteristic of Mississippi is the preponderance of composed tunes. Composed here, we know who. Hoyt Ming, Willie Narmer, John Gatwood, some of the guys in the Leake County Revelers. It just goes on and on for where we know who wrote what, or at least whatever writing means in this dialect. Um, and he's, I, I want to speak to the creative part by playing you a little snippet. Um, Thank you. This, the, the, and, and forgive me if I have to like take a second take at it. Uh, holding two tunes that are really similar in your head is, is a peculiar skill. Some days it's good. Um, there was a pop tune from the 1890s called um, Hot Time in the Old Town Tonight. Theodore Roosevelt used it as, theme, as his theme song when he was uh, in the Spanish-American War in Cuba with the Rough Riders. Um, and it was a song. So I want to play you a little bit of that. And then I want to play you the title track off of the 1971 LP that uh, Hoyt Ming and the Pep Steppers put out under the title of New Hot Times. So obviously, Hoyt's take on the pop tune from the 1890s. I'll do a little breath between the two so you can distinguish them. sort of hear the original in there <laughs> yeah 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 that is a uh, dumb dumb question i'm going to ask it anyway was wait I mean, most of these folks weren't classically trained in any musical background right i mean these are they picking this all up from the area area area, or is there a combination of various levels of formal music training here um i believe will gilmer of the Leake County Revelers, which was the best-selling Mississippi string band in, in the 78 era, partly because they started early before the Depression. Um, he has some of the best tone. 
I'm not exactly sure about that, but there's some chance of some, not like conservatory training, but having taken some classical music lessons somewhere along the way. And I strongly suspect that Eugene Clarity had some. He was a note reader, uh, and that was rare to be able to read from notation. Um, and some of the tunes that he recorded are, are like out of, you know, English, Scottish, contradance, classic collections of fiddle tunes like Howes from the 1800s. Um, that's like a clog. I mean, you know, in, you know, honk and not southern tunes. And then he plays Little Black Mustache, uh, which is a, uh, there's a pop song from the 1890s by that, but the fiddle tune is just this other thing, and it's brilliant, beautiful mm. thing, um, and smells very strongly of Mississippi and nowhere else. Yeah. It just doesn't turn up. Great tune. That's great. That's great. Uh, oh, go ahead, Harry. I'm sorry. Uh, well, I think that kind of winds up what I can tell you about Hoyt Ming. That's of no, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, you know, we've got a lot of we'll have a lot of students and and and, and faculty, um, obviously, who are are, are are part of this program uh, today, Harry, and put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into this program. Um, when when you're addressing students and faculty, and we think about the story of Mississippi fiddle music and what what are the what's the big lesson from your mind that we can get out of this story writ large and what's it going to take to keep that story propagating first and foremost it was created here in Mississippi by often subsistence farmers um, agricultural workers anyway because everybody was an agricultural worker in that time period. Um, and other than cotton, there wasn't a lot in the way of commercial crops. And these are <clears throat> white people. So they weren't doing cotton in quite the same way. My grandfather did a cotton crop. I mean, it, you know, but uh, a lot of the farming was subsistence. Feed your family. Just get through. As one of my fiddlers said, you know, we had no, there was no cash in the economy before the Depression. There was no cash in the economy during the Depression. And there was no cash in the economy after. We didn't even notice. It, it's always been a relatively poor state. So this was the art form that's native to Mississippi. And through all the research I've done, I just keep coming up on it's made here. You don't hear it somewhere else. And it reflects how people felt about music, how they were able to organize it in an untrained fashion in the classical sense but quite well schooled in all the songs they ever heard. Ragtime floated through. There was a brass band on the town square. There was church music. They might have heard, eventually heard some stuff on the radio. They absorbed whatever they had. They worked with the tools at hand. Mm -hmm. So they made it here. And you know, that's something to be proud of. Now there's snippets that are traditionally used from elsewhere but it's a collage art form making fiddle tunes anyway a lot of the titles are of meaning to the people in the area they're going up to hamburg charleston where the southern cross is a dog which is down in moorhead the two train lines poor little mary in the corner evocative we don't know what it's about jenny on the railroad monkey in the dog cart sweet milk and peaches What's this going to mean to somebody in North Dakota? But here, you know, it, it's got resonance. And for the people who made fiddle tunes or took a fiddle tune and put this title on it, this is the pop music of their youth. This is shared meaning. These are little, I think of fiddle tunes as like sketches or small paintings. And there's a whole lot of stuff packed in that's not really verbal, just as a painting is not verbal. But it still tells an emotional story. And sometimes I know from personally to remember a tune, the more things I know about the fiddle tune, the easier I can remember it and play it. And sometimes the things I remember are the people I've played it with, the good times I've shared, that great party, that dance I played when events happened of <laughs> various kinds, things we remember. So music becomes part of the soundtrack of your life. We're used to the radio, but this was intense, personal, and somebody sweating in front of you doing it. So personal meaning, stories about place and time, about places in Mississippi, 
And then the other thing to remember is that this music is from an entirely different time and place that we can't share. We might have grandparents that would have resonated with, but there was no mass communication, no computers, no video, uh, no access to the vast amounts of music we have now. Not no access. People, there were things to hear. There was sheet music. There were piano players. There were there was some, but the overwhelming amount we have now was not there when this music was created. And the people that play this stuff at festivals now tend to be college educated East Coast people, an entirely different demographic than the people who created it. They've taken it up and carried it on and found the best part of it, which tends to be um, instrumental. The vocal music and the themes in the vocal music haven't carried on as well. Some of it's reprehensible, some of it's just antiquated. But the music itself still speaks to us. And I think that's that's just fascinating that the style still has resonance, even with an entirely different demographic. Um, and I think it's worth keeping and keeping it going. I write tunes in this tradition. I've researched it, done two massive books on it, put out a batch, four or five CDs of my own playing this fiddle music. I've produced vintage recordings of field recordings and got them out there, three, three of those projects. I've written about 80 tunes using titles from Mississippi where the tunes were forever lost and it, it pained me. So I made up the tunes as best I could. Uh, I've done concerts with my band, the Mississippi Travelers up here. I've been on, interviewed like this on the radio, TV, podcasts, and documentary films. I've taught in the States, New York and Germany at camps, workshops at festivals, and informal sessions everywhere in addition to my own teaching to try to get as many of these tunes remembered and played, mm -hmm. enjoyed. So there's a body of music there that represents an earlier time and a continuing time. There's people that have great fond memories of sweet milk and peaches, but they're thinking about 10 years ago at that great party they were at. So there's continuity, even right. among a different crowd. Right. It's valuable. It's our yeah, it's resource. Hey, that's beautiful. And thank you for, you know, you're a masterful storytelling and storyteller uh, in your own right, obviously, and have done so much to keep this rich, rich tradition alive. And I think um, everybody in Mississippi and the country, the world for that matter, because uh, this is, as you know, uh, you go to Clifftop in West Virginia, which is the gathering of old time music. And you've got not only all 50 states represented, but you've got Sweden and Ireland and Japan and South Asia. It's it's So it is a worldwide tradition. And thank you so much for that. We've got to get you to Starkville. When we all, you know, knock on wood, uh, hopefully here in the next year or two, gather in person again. Um, certainly, hopefully the next year. Let's don't, I don't want two years, but um, we'd love to get you to Starkville for some more storytelling and a live performance. Um, that would be terrific. Um, but in the meantime, Harry, if you don't mind, as an outro, leave us with leave us with one uh, one one final snippet of of this wonderful Mississippi fiddle music, if you don't mind. Let me preface it with a, a, a succinct short story. Sure. This uh, um, this is about Claude Pickle. Now, all I know about the fiddler Claude Pickle and his short life was that in the teens, about 1916, he, he showed up at the Kosciuszko fiddle contest. Didn't place, didn't win, don't know what he played, but he showed up. The next mention is in 19, December 9th, 1925, in a newspaper account, a short bit. He went to a, he and his cousin Lonnie went to a square dance in Dossville. They had a good time. I suspect they were drinking. They were both enamored of one particular young lady, but were apparently a little shy. It got to be the end of the evening. The fiddler played Home Sweet Home, put his fiddle away, and the dance was going to be over. Claude, to his credit, didn't want to miss this big opportunity. So he went up to the fiddler, offered him 50 cents to play one more tune so he could dance with the girl. Lonnie didn't like that. He went up to the fiddler and offered him a dollar not to play. <laughs> Knives were drawn. <laughs> Short, shall we say, dance on the floor. Mm. 
Claude was mortally wounded, fell to the ground. Lonnie was uninjured. Claude passed away. The headline was, Paying the Fiddler Causes Killing. Short life of trouble. Ooh. And uh, I did a little poster on that because it's such a succinct story. And I've, I've been writing tunes to try to carry on the tradition. I've done about 80 of them using titles uh, from Mississippi. I used them all up. And then I realized, oh, I missed an obvious one. I had to write Claude Pickles' Last Waltz, as which we'll conclude with. <laughs> 